you have ambition to be great. My job is to coach you to get all that greatness out of you. What is good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy Reason. We are back here for another one. And it's another day. Another couple great hires by Mike McDaniel. Now, really, only everyone's only really talking about the quarterback coach. But remember, I warned you all, right? What did I say? That they're, you know, the running game and passing game coordinator positions might still be in play. And as much as everyone's talking about Bevel just being the quarterback coach, he's also a passing game coordinator right we'll get into that we'll talk about him fantastic hire now it's not done but it's done um that that'll be announced um and then obviously another offensive line coach has been added to the fray we'll talk about that also i got a couple articles i want to go over with you guys it was barry jackson's tech takeaways from mcdaniel's um media tour and then also you remember Marcel Louis Jacques was releasing pieces of his sit down interview with Mike McDaniel. Well, he's actually now released the article based upon that. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll obviously give an updated look at what the coaching staff currently looks like under him, under Mike McDaniel. And also, Mike Gusecki again goes to bat publicly for Durham Smythe to get paid. We'll talk about that because. I will have next week. I will be dropping my top 10 free agent target list like I did last year. Um, there will be all 22 involved. There will be obviously extensive little breakdowns of each player. Um, we'll go over that. Um, and Derm, you know, and Derm Smythe, and I will be having a show coming this week on Thursday night. We will talk about. Five Dolphin players that Mike McDaniel should let walk and five Dolphin players that they should retain. I'm going to tell you right now, Derm Smythe is on that list. Um, and he has been since I uh, wrote out my list a couple. I've had that list done for like, a you know, since I did two lists when Mike McDaniel got hired. I did that list and I did my free agent list as soon as we made the hiring. So we got those. Um, and so free agent video next week and then we are about probably two weeks away from my first big board for the 2022 draft dropping for you guys as you'll know no one does it like me scouting reports on each player that i have as well as all 22 footage none of this broadcast nonsense because when you scout players you need to watch the real thing not this broadcast stuff now if there's players in the Sun Belt where you can only get, for example, you can only get broadcast footage, I get that. But when we're talking about SET, SEC teams, ACC teams, et cetera, et cetera, there should be no excuses, really. So, you know, um, I'm not someone, you know, I know some other people are going to be out here reading mock drafts and reading other people's work on the draft network. I don't even read the draft network. And they're going to be going all over the, these and they're going to be basing their opinions off of other people's work and they're going to be trying to sell it to you guys as oh i know what i'm talking about negative 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 reason does the homework and reason does the homework all year long baby so uh we will be getting into my big boards at starting at the end of uh february right that's why you know you go back to my mock drafts last year i was the one who i even hit rashad bateman to the Ravens. So I hit players not coming to just the Dolphins, but players going to other teams as well. So um yeah, we'll uh we'll we'll get into that stuff uh by yeah, by the end of the month. We'll be dropping my first big board. I'm planning uh my free agency list will come next week and then the following week we'll drop the first big board. Um, I'm probably going to drop early versions of them to Patreons and members first. Um and yeah, so, um, and then what, what else we got coming up and then, man, and then, you know, we're a couple weeks, March is going to be big board season, free agency season. Um, and then, uh, next week we're also going to go over, um, you know, the top needs for the Miami dolphins heading into free agency. Um, and then we'll revise that after free agency. And we'll do it heading into the draft. So, baby, you know where it is. You know where it is. 
if inside the NFL is your number one stop for the Miami Dolphins in the offseason, through OTAs, through training camp, and into the regular season, they don't stop here. So um, no one's got you covered like Reason does. You know I got your, your backs. So we're going to get into all that stuff. Um, things are about to pick up. Really, I would have already been getting into this stuff, but I've been waiting on this coaching staff to come together. I've been waiting, waiting on the hiring process to play out. Now that it has, now I can start making my moves, man. Um, so we're going to, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, I see people doing mock drafts right now. It's like, why are we doing mock drafts? Wait till free agency needs change. You know what I mean? Like needs change. So when I see people doing like, whether it's on Twitter, or YouTube, talking about like mock drafts or building, you know, and, and we didn't even have our coaching staff in place and people are doing mock drafts and building. And now even still like, I, I, it's way too early for mock drafts for me. So do not expect mock drafts until at least after free agency starts to die down. So, I mean, people can do their own personal mock drafts on the side. That's cool. But I don't think that's valuable content right now because it's, it's everything's going to change after free agency. Right. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to waste everyone's time, your time and my time. I'm not trying to do that. So that's the last thing I'm ever trying to do. Um, I know I'm not the only, there's 355 people right now. I know I'm not the only one here that's a parent, so I'm not trying to waste your time and you're not trying to waste my time. It's just how it is. So uh, we're going to, we're going to see how it plays out. I'll really, but my big boards, I've already got a bunch of my big boards put together um, with my preliminary scouting reports that I just have to expand on. And so, yeah, I think I've already got like two big boards, two or three big, I've got running backs done. I've got wide receivers done. Um, and now I'm moving on to offensive line and I'll do linebackers and stuff like that too. So I'm already like ahead of the game. I just got to basically start putting everything together. So I got my graphic guy, my new graphic guy, he's working towards stuff and we're, we're setting everything up. So yeah, free agency next week, top 10 free agency list. And then my first big board will be coming out the week after. And it is going to be, we're starting with a bang. We are starting with a bag. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop that running back big board on y'all y'all had right out the gate this year, right out the gate. We're gonna drop the running back big board. All right, that's gonna be the first one we drop, and then I'm probably gonna do wide receiver right after that, and uh, then we're gonna go from there. So <clears throat> I'm I'm gonna do probably five for y'all, but I might do six because there's a six position I do want to. So we'll see how it rolls. Um, and then. I'm thinking I'm going to, cause I got a top 50 player list. Is that a 50? It's like at 50 or 75 or something like that. And I might drop that on your heads too. So <clears throat> I've got a lot of draft content coming. Um, free agency stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll get into motion with that really with my free agent target list. People are going to get a general idea of where I'm going. Um, and then we're going to be giving free agency updates, you know, as they happen and stuff like that. So, um, uh, Philip Leduc, who would you want number one as a middle linebacker, either free agency or draft to complete this badass? If I could have anyone, Nicobe Dean, uh, Jim McEwen, the number 29 pick depends on them filling online line needs in free agency. Exactly, exactly why I'm not getting ahead of myself. I'm timing it so you know. I'm going to have two sexy positions out for you guys, running back and wide receiver by the time free agency rolls around. And then I let free agency play out. And then I let my O-line, I'm going to do my O-line big boards after free agency, right? Like if we sign a center, then I don't need to do my center big board. You know what I mean? If we sign one tackle, I might give y'all like the opposite tackle. So if we sign a left tackle, I might give you a right tackle big board, a strictly right tackle big board. You know, if we sign an interior guy, then I'm not going to give you guys anyone that I think is a guard or should be kicked into guard. You know what I mean? So I'm going to let free agency play it out for my uh, my release of the big boards for you. I'm going to do them in the meantime because I've already done a lot of preliminary work on them. So I'm going to wrap them up. But there's a process I go through, and so I'll stop it at like basically the second step of my process. Any thoughts on a Tunsil trade? I talked about the Tunsil stuff a couple months ago. 
Remember, if, if you guys go back in December, I believe, I reported to all y'all that I was hearing and seeing that Tunsil was on the block back in December. If you remember correctly, I told everyone they shut Tunsil down. He was ready to come back, but they shut Tunsil down because they were going to be looking to trade him in the offseason. Remember, when Watson was still on the table, I was saying trade for Watson and Tunsil back in like December. Thing is, Watson's no longer on the table. Uh, Tunsil trade, Tunsil makes sense. But remember, what did San Francisco pay for Trent Williams? Go do your homework. Trent Williams was at a much higher upper echelon than where Tunsil is currently at his career in his career right now. And what do you go for, like a third and a fifth? So, I mean, I'm down with Laramie Tunsil 110%. But they are not going to trade a first-round pick for Laramie Tunsil. I will tell you that right now. Rome, are you sure he went for a second and a third? I thought Trent Williams was for a third and a fifth. If I remember correctly, someone look it up. I'm pretty sure he went for third and a fifth. Look up San Francisco 49ers Trent Williams trade. See what he gets traded for. I'm pretty sure it was a, th a third and a fifth. I agree Tunsil's younger, but Trent Williams was like already a top five left tackle in football. Like there was no doubt about it. Tunsil's like a top 10. Those penalties are ridiculous. So, um, and Tunsil and Russell's right. Tunsil makes money right now. Doesn't he make like over 20 million a year? So you got to take on contract. Yes, third and a fifth. There you go. Fluid confirmed. I knew it was a third and a fifth. So listen, if I'm if I'm going to have to take on, because Trent Williams had to get paid too, if I remember correctly, right? If I remember correctly, Trent Williams also had to be paid. So here's the thing. Tunsil's already paid, but that's taken a, you know, that's a 20 plus million, blah, 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 right? So they're probably going to try and finagle for like a second or a conditional I mean, hey, would I cry if they gave up their first? No, because it's the 29th pick. Are you going to find a better player than Laramie Tunsil at 29? Probably not. But I'm going to tell you right now, the contract's going to be the sticking point for Laramie Tunsil of why a team is going to kind of be squeamish about giving a first. Now, I think we got like the 49th or 47th pick in the second round. I don't remember. I, I looked at it a couple days ago. I can't remember. It's 47 or 49. So... Would you? I'll trade that for Trent Williams. Let's go. Shout out to Garrett Lambert for the five dollar, um, for the five dollar donation. Rhino says Tunsil's dead money this year. Twenty six million. Ah, we got fifty this year. Are you sure? I thought it was like forty seven or forty nine. I believe you guys. Um, let me see. Uh, all right. Let me make sure here. You guys are correct. We have the 50th pick. Uh, um, my trusty old draft value chart told me that. All right. Yeah. So we got the 50th overall pick. Yeah. Man. Just looking at the draft value right now, if you were to combine our 29th and our 50th pick, that gets us to like 15. Yeah, the value gets us to like 15. Wow. Wow. Charles Cross ain't going to slide like that. Evan Neal ain't going to slide like that. I don't even think my boy Drake London will slide like that. Traylon Burks might. Well, Traylon Burks will probably slide like that. I'm just trying to think here. If there's going to be anyone worth moving up to. Uh. Anyways, yeah. Um, 
yeah, the 50th pick. I mean, I'll give you the 50th pick for Trent Williams. Let's go. Jameson Williams will probably be there for 29. I agree with whoever's saying that. Jameson Williams, I would take. That guy's a beast. That's a monster. Um, Nicobe Dean might be gone because usually linebackers start going in the mid 20s, right? I don't think Walker's going to be there at 50, Kjax. Everyone always gets – it's the same thing every year. Everyone always gets arrogant that there's going to be a guy there for our second pick. Like, I do think three of the four, Isaiah Spiller, Kyron Williams, Kenneth Walker, because y'all know me, I love Kyron Williams, and Brees Hall – Three of those four will be gone by the 50th pick. I can pretty much guarantee you that. Like, the good thing is there's four good running backs you like, and Kenneth Walker might be the last to go because of his inability to pass block. Like, that's why I don't know if I'd take him at 29. You know, Brees Hall makes more sense at 29. Even Isaiah Spiller... Hell, Kyron Williams, most rounded out complete guy. He might make more sense because this is where I go at the 29th. You got to look at the 29th like this. This is why, you know, I would get them trading for Trent Williams with the 29th pick. The 29th pick is a glorified second round pick. All right. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, Rome. Like Walker can't pass block or catch. Yeah, he's not like that great of a catcher. You know what I mean? Like, if you actually think, like, he makes sense. If you could, bro, if you get those hands, you know, I kind of, I want to see him in a pro system because remember, everyone doubted Jonathan Taylor as a, as a pass catcher, right? Just because he didn't get a lot of opportunities and stuff. Yo, Rome Gray, everyone is sleeping on Al Year out of BYU. Everyone is sleeping on Tyler Al Year out of BYU. That guy is a beast. Tyler Orion, Jahan Dotson at 29. I'm good. Why are we drafting a 5'10, 5'11 guy at 29 when we already have Waddle? We need someone to complement Waddle. And if we want to get a slot guy, which is what Jahan Dotson would be in this offense, why not get Wandell Robinson in the second or the third? Better value. I don't like Jahan Dotson. I'm trying to get, man. Uh, no. I don't even have Jahan. I, let me see. Let me just bring up my big board here for right now. I'm going to tell you all right now. I'm going to lay down the hammer on Jahan Dotson. I got Jahan Dotson as my uh, as my wide receiver six. If he's there in the second, if he's there at 50, if Jahan Dotson is there at 50, sure, I'm down. I'm down. If he's there, if he's there at 50, I'm down. But I think my most controversial take for some people this year will be I have David Bell hire the kid out of Purdue. I have him higher than Jahan Dotson. Don't sleep on David Bell, man. That guy is legit. And I see a lot of Christian Watson love. I do have Christian Watson in my top 15. The thing is, Greer doesn't like to draft small small school guys like Christian Watson. So do I think he's going to draft Christian Watson? Probably not. Randy Constance, many blessings. You do great work, brother. Appreciate you, man. Birthday in three days, baby. We got a Friday birthday. I'll be live for a birthday stream. And Rome Gray knows what's good. See, Rome Gray been my, been my boy. David Bell is better than Dotson. Yes, sir. I agree. But that's enough draft talk. That's enough preview. Let's get into this, baby. Uh, let's get into this. All right. Let's talk about our hiring. Um, because you know what? The quarterback coach and passing game coordinator we just brought on. I love it. Another solid hire. Someone tell me Mike McDaniel and he put in together a fantastic offensive staff right now. Tell me. Appreciate you, Will Harmon. Aquarius are smart. I'd like to think of myself as one of the smarter guys in this community, so I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, uh, you know, I love the hire. You know, um, 
you know, you look at some of the guys Daryl Belleville's work with. This is going to be good. This is a legit proven guy we're bringing in. You know, we're going to, I kept saying with McDaniel, I said from the moment before we even hired McDaniel, I said with McDaniel, we will get a proper evaluation of Tua and see where he is at. And look at the people he's starting to put around Tua. Oh, we're going to find out what the deal with Tua is this year. I've been telling all y'all this since before. I said I wanted Harbaugh, Caldwell. We would really find out this year in year three where Tua's at and what Tua can be. And I, I stand on that. So let's get into this right here. It started earlier um, today. Um. And, you know, I'm trying to click on something and it got me liking some random tweet. Not even. Um, put that there. People just clowning. RIP. Dolphins are working toward adding Darren Daryl Bevel as passing game coordinator, quarterbacks coach per sources. Longtime OC and interim coach at two stops gives new coach Mike McDaniel plenty of experience. Okay, here we go. So Bevel, some of the quarterbacks he's worked with, Matt Stafford, um, he was with Russell Wilson from 2011 to 2017, and he worked with Brett Favre directly. So, um, you know, he was a key factor in the early development of Russell Wilson. It was Daryl Bevel. Now, I'm not saying Tua Tungalo is going to be Russell Wilson. I'm just telling you what's good. Um, I think by adding Daryl Bevel, this is a guy who he was also, um, and I believe he's worked with Trevor Lawrence too. He was the interim head coach. I want to say for the Jaguars, um, this year after they fired Urban Meyer, he was the interim head coach. So it's another guy with head coaching experience, right? Uh, birthday is Friday too, my man. I appreciate you, Chris. That's cool, bro. And Martina says he banged the table for Russell Wilson in the draft. Apparently, yes, he did. So, you know, we're getting a guy who he's got head coaching experience. You know, he stepped in and he won a game with that Jaguars team after... Urban Meyer left. You know, and th so he's worked with Trevor Lawrence. He's worked with Matt Stafford. He's worked with Brett Favre. He worked with um, Russell Wilson for seven seasons. Like, I'm telling you right now, the coaching staff Mike McDaniel is putting together on the offensive side is phenomenal. This guy... And we'll get into Chandler Henley too, but the this the stuff this guy is doing right now, you just have to applaud it. I'm sorry, it's good stuff. It really is. Um, you know he's been an offensive coordinator, he's been a positional coach, he's been an interim coach, and I told you, you know, like uh, so, uh, you know, he's offensive coordinator with Minnesota and Seattle. Um, you know, he's a four-year starting quarterback himself at Wisconsin, you know, um, so, you know, he's had, you know, multiple players follow him because when he went to Minnesota, you know, Brett Favre and Tavares Jackson and Sidney Rice and Percy ha Harvin, you know, they followed him around, right? Like when he was with Brett Favre, Tavares Jackson, Sidney Rice, and Percy Harvin all followed Bevel to the Seattle Seahawks. Right? He pushed for Russell Wilson. He was the offensive coordinator when the Seattle Seahawks won their Super Bowl. It was Daryl Bevel. This is a Super Bowl winning coordinator we're bringing in as a positional coach and a passing coordinator. You're telling me you don't like this? Right? Seattle's offense ranked in the top 10 in scoring each of the four years with Bevel as an offensive coordinator. Think of the Pro Bowl guys he's coached as an offensive coordinator 
in this league, right? Adrian Peterson, Brett Favre, Doug Baldwin, Marshawn Lynch, Jimmy Grant, Kenny Galladay, Frank Ragno, Steve Hutchinson, who's now in the Hall of Fame. Like we're talking with a guy who's who's been with a lot of a, a lot of people that are that are good, and he's got a reputation as a high character type of guy, right? He built a pretty good relationship with Trevor Lawrence, from what I understand. Um, so, you know what I mean? I, I like it. I think this is a very good hire. I think we brought in a guy who he can lean on. A guy he can trust. Another good teacher. This man is putting together a staff of great teachers with proven track records with all pros, Hall of Famers, Pro Bowlers, championships underneath them. And they're taking positional coach jobs. Like, this is, I'm telling you, our offense is going, guys, by year three, our offense is going to be scary good. I'm telling you, year two, we might even be there. Year one, we are going to see a massive turnaround and leap. I'm telling you right now. And all these hires keep screaming, and we'll talk about the next one. Run, 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 run. I wish Ricky Williams was ready, was healthy and in his prime, and we had just traded for him. I'm telling you, I've told y'all from the beginning. Haven't you noticed the offensive staff he's piecing together is like this beautiful portrait, but the defensive staff is all the same guys. You're telling me Mike McDaniel is hands-on with that defensive staff? I told y'all what I was told. Tom Garfunkel has more say. Once Fangio basically turned us down, it was... Garfinkel's idea, we're rolling with Boyer and that staff. Keep him intact. Because if we would have seen, like, McDaniel have some, because a smart move for McDaniel would be, there's a few positional coaching openings. Find your guys, put them in those positional coach. There's like, what? We need a defensive backs coach. We need, what? Let me look. Let me just double check. We need... A safety and a defensive backs coach right now, right? So if he could find his guy who we thought was ready to take a step up in a couple years, you could bring your guy in and insert him into this defense so they could learn the personnel, the vision, the scheme, how to operate. And then, boom, you can elevate them when you need to if you get in a pinch. But he's very hands-off with the defense. But then we see how hands-on and how meticulous and how everything's being placed on the offense you're like, okay, it's clear he doesn't have that much say on the defensive side of the ball this year. It's clear they're politicking still behind the scenes. And that's fine. Let's hope Boyer finds his 2020 form. Let's hope it plays out. All we need is the players on the defensive side. Follow McDaniel. If they follow and believe in McDaniel, they will listen to Boyer whether they like him or don't. And that's it. And we might need an O line back, uh, no outside linebacker coach. You guys are correct too, because Leonard left. So, you know, I'm seeing this come together. I love our staff right now on the offensive side of the ball. I think this is just a phenomenal, phenomenal staff. And the ball's in Boyer's court because if he doesn't step up, if he doesn't produce, McDaniel, that the way he's building our offense is going to gain cachet in Ross's office. He's going to turn around at the end of the season. He said, okay, you saw me start to build my offense. Let me start tinkering with this defense because it's not where I want it at. And then we're going to get going. So, you know, we'll see. But I like it. I like it right now. I really do. I like where this is headed. The staff we are putting together on the offensive side of the football looks like it's going to be damn good, and it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. Rhino, uh, Greer wanted to hire McDaniel as the offensive coordinator, right? And 
that was blocked. The interview was blocked by Shanahan, so they couldn't even get a chance to hire him. He got promoted. So, um, I like it. I'm a big fan of this hire. I'm a big fan of how this staff is coming together. And I think we're going to see some good things coming in the near future with this offense. Get ready. Get ready. Um, and this is what Omar Kelly had to say about the hire. Um, Omar Kelly, uh, you know, pursuing Daryl Bevel. The Miami Dolphins are reportedly turning to vet- to a veteran NFL assistant to coordinate the passing game and coach the team's quarterbacks. According to multiple reports, Daryl Bevel, who last served as the offensive coordinator and interim head coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars, is a front runner to serve as Mike McDaniel's passing game coordinator and quarterbacks coach. Bevel's career began as an offensive assistant in Green Bay, where he coached Brett Favre in the West Coast offense McDaniel plans to install. From there, he served as the Minnesota offensive coordinator from 2006 to 2010, where he again coached Favre, who followed him, like I said, right? He then served as the offensive uh, coordinator for the Seattle Seahawks, um, where again, Vikings, you know, Sidney Rice, Percy Harvin, guys following him there now, um, where he served as the offensive coordinator from 2011 to 2017, the Detroit Lions offensive coordinator from 2019 to 2020, before ending the season as the Lions interim head coach when Patricia was fired. And this past season, he was a coordinator for, so he's coached twice. And he was a coordinator for Urban Meyer's Jaguars team before taking over as interim coach when Meyer was fired. In his two stints as an interim coach, he's two and seven, but he's coached Favre, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Matt Stafford, and Trevor Lawrence. And the hope is he could help quarterback Tua Tungvaloa's game get to the next level if hired in Miami. The Dolphins have already hired former um, Los Angeles assistant Frank Smith to serve as the offensive coordinator. Um, Bevel, who played quarterback at Wisconsin under Barry Alvarez in the early 1990s, would likely focus on the passing game. Former NFL receiver Wes Welker was hired to coach receivers, and Miami retained Eric Studesville to coach the tailbacks. Considering he was instrumental in the de- selection of Wilson in Seattle in his early development, it's possible that his quick pass concepts, which are a staple of the West Coast offense, could help Tua become more efficient. However, Lawrence struggled for most of his rookie season where he led the Jaguars to a 3-14 and record as a team starter. Lawrence completed 59% of his passes, throwing for 3,641 yards and 12 touchdowns. McDaniel has hired or retained most of the coaching staff, but a few more positions do feel do do are do remain to be filled before his staff is complete. So again, this man's track record speaks for him set for itself. I don't know what else to say. Great hire. You know, it's not for optics like Charlie Fry. We've got a proven guy with a proven track record of developing and working with quarterbacks that matter. So, you know, McDaniel's also putting in a Tua in the best situation possible, but also in a situation where, hey, if you fail with all this stuff around you, then, you know, questions have to be asked. Options might need to be explored, but we still need free agency and the draft to fill the team out. And then, um, so, you know, I do think Tua is going to succeed, though. I think we're going to see the best version of Tua we've seen at the NFL level this year under this coaching staff. I truly do. And where I'm at with how they're putting the coaching staff together, y'all are going to think I'm crazy. Why not draft a backup in the fifth round and let this staff develop a young guy as a backup quarterback and see what you what you build? You know what I mean? Or if you want to go get a veteran, I'm down for Tyrod Taylor and others. Um, you know, Mariota would be fine for me, I guess. Um, but it's going to be, you know, the thing is these guys want money, and I don't think they're going to spend a lot of money on a backup quarterback. So it'll be interesting to see if there's no backup quarterback by the end of free agency. It's going to, you know, I'm going to wonder if they're going to draft a guy on day three, you know, so a, a day three pick. So, um, and then <clears throat> Josh Kendall of the Athletic, he had this. The Atlanta Falcons have parted ways with wide receiver coach Dave Brock. They will also have to replace offensive line coach assistant Chandler Henley, 
who is taking a position with the Miami Dolphins, according to his source. So, listen, we are adding another offensive line mind. What does this tell you? Okay, we had an historically... McDaniel wasn't lying when he told us he watched the tape. McDaniel was not lying when he told us all he watched the tape. Because right now he's telling you, I watched the tape. And he's now hired, you know, John Embry, Frank Smith, Matt Applebaum, and now Chandler Henley, as well as himself. So he's including himself. He's brought in five offensive line minds. You know, those guys also work with tight ends as well, right? He's brought in, so Applebaum, you know, Frank Smith um, and Embry have worked with tight ends too. So you look at this right now and it's like, what does this tell you? This tells you they're going to run the football. This tells you they're getting all these minds together to properly evaluate the Austin Jacksons, the Robert Hunts, the Solomon Kinleys, the Michael Dieters, the Liam Eikenbergs, and find out where they got to go, where they need to shore up, and how to attack. And this is telling you that he is not taking this offensive line turnover. He is not messing around with it. It's coming. The offensive line is coming. We are going to have a top 20 offensive line in 2022. I guarantee it. I guarantee we have a top 20 offensive line in 2022. And I want to know which one of these guys is driving Jesse Davis out of town right now. Who called the Uber? Who loaded his ass up? And who's taking him out of town? Who packed his bags and said, you're out of here? That's the real question. All these guys have worked with tight ends, offensive, off, you know, tight ends, O-lines, and specialized in run games. What does this tell us? What is the theme here? What is the correlation? The correlation is, guess what? We're going to run the football, and we're going to turn over this offensive line. I'm going to tell you right now. In what? Three weeks? What? How long has it been since he's been hired? Two weeks? Two weeks since Mike McDaniel has been hired, not only has he assembled the best offensive staff we've had in years, he played ball and was willing to try and keep continuity with our current defensive personnel, whether it be the staff or the players. So he's or like he's already making concessions, but yet he's already making the proper hires, the proper moves to do all the things Flores didn't do early on in his career. And this is just another example about it. And just to you guys know, Henley was the captain of Yale's 2006 Ivy League championship team, the same team that Mike McDaniel was a wide receiver on, I believe. He played along Mike McDaniel in college. And the other thing with Henley is, as piss poor as they were in pass probe, and that's because they haven't drafted anyone in Atlanta. They haven't actually made an effort to put talent for these guys to coach up. They were still had the sixth best team run blocking grade, according to PFF. Exactly, real deal. Flores didn't have the Rolodex. You notice how McDaniel's Rolodex is okay. We got some 49ers, but then we got all here, 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 here. Flores was just okay. Well, I know everyone at New England. Let's get Chad O'Shea. Let's just bring everyone over from New England. Where this guy's pulling all these different minds from all these different areas, whether it's the NFL, the college, wherever he's got to go.
I don't get it. I just don't get it. How can someone not be excited by what's happening right now? This is just two weeks into the job. I, I, my expectations for free agency in the draft are so high right now because of them. Like, it's literally unbelievable. Because of the work Mike McDaniel has been putting together, my expectations of this draft and free agency are so high. Because I'm like, this guy's done this in two weeks. So, another great hire. Another fantastic hire. I absolutely love what we're seeing here from this man, Mike McDaniel. I told you guys he would surround himself with a bunch of teachers and good communicators, and here we go. We're seeing nothing but that. And. You know, guys who are willing to uh, good communicators, good teachers, but they're also willing to take proper accountability, not give us some generic answer live to our face. And then they go out and they tell everyone a totally different story behind the scenes. So I'm a fan right now. I was already a fan, but I keep becoming a bigger Mike McDaniel fan by the day when I see the staff coming around. It's just crazy to me. It's just, it's a, just to watch this come together is beautiful. This man, he is determined not to fail right now. And I hope Ross and Garfinkel and Greer don't get in his way and let him operate because I do think this guy's going to build something special in Miami. I truly believe that. So continuing on now, after those two hires, here is the current staff for Mike McDaniels. We've been doing this with every hire. Let's keep going. So Mike McDaniel is the current head coach. Frank Smith, offensive coordinator, did fantastic work with offensive lines everywhere he's gone. Josh Boyer is a DC. Danny Crossman is a special teams coordinator. The QB coach and passing game coordinator is Daryl Bevel. The um, assistant head coach and tight ends coach is John Embry. Wes Welker is the wide receiver coach. Eric Studesville is the running back coach. Matt Applebaum is the offensive line coach. Your assistant offensive line coach right now is Chandler Henley. Um, quarterback coach um, retained Charles Burks. Anthony Campanelli was retained as a linebacker coach. Austin Clark was retained as the defensive line coach. And really, outside linebacker and special special team, sorry, and safety DB is what remain, really. And then we're going to get into, like, assistance and stuff, right? So... Um, hit that like button, man. We got 725 of you in here, guys. Smash that like button, subscribe if you're new. Um, I, I I really like what we're seeing, man. Daddy Dean says, Mr. Insight, able to get back to Patreon. Awesome content. Man, I hope everything's well, Daddy Dean. I hope your kid's doing well, man. I'm I hope to see you guys at either training camp um or a regular season game this year. We're gonna have a get together, guys. We're gonna have a get together, right? So yeah, I like how this offensive uh, staff has come together. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm taking a wait and see approach with our defensive staff, right? I need Boyer to be the 2020 form. I can't have that 2021 form of Boyer. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, you know, I'll, I'm taking a wait and see approach with our defense staff, loving on our offensive staff right now. Absolutely loving it. Very, very excited, you know, very excited. And you listen to all the smart minds, the minds that know football, guess what? They're saying the same thing I'm saying. That's a, it's a correlation right there for you. all So I love it, man. Uh, I like the, how the staff is coming together. Interested to see uh, the offensive turnaround and free agency and through the draft.
Now, continuing on, let's just show y'all. I wanted to show you guys. Let's compare our offensive line coaches from last year. Shout out to the homie Bobby Shouts Jr. on Twitter. He always he's been posting some good stuff lately. So I wanted to show you this. He he posted a good comparison. Let's compare Matt Applebaum to how Coach Lemuel Jean Pierre answers questions. So let let's do a little. Let's play a comparison game of what we've got now compared to what we had. Right. Let's uh let, let's let's get into this because um for me at least. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> when I'm going to put it into visual perspective for you guys, you know, you guys are really going to be like, oh my God, this go you know, I told you guys, Emile Jean-Pierre was not the guy when I heard him say Tristan Wirfs, when he called Tristan Wirfs, he basically told y'all he would have played my guard. I was like, oh my God, get this guy off my staff. Get this guy out of here is literally what I was thinking to myself. And then, you know, now when you hear everyone talk, when you when you compare Applebaum to Lemuel Jean-Pierre, you're like, oh, my God. You know, I've talked about it before. And I don't mean disrespect because, I mean, I played with them. They're in every sport. You know what I mean? It. I really get the sense that, you know, the biggest problem with, this guy was, you know, with Lemuel Jean Pierre was, he's, he just seems like he comes off like he's a meathead. Like he comes off like he's not very smart. And I, I'm so happy he's no longer employed by the Miami Dolphins. Like the guy is just so brutal. It's, it, it's brutal. Like I don't, I don't know what else to say. Um, all right, hold on. Let me play this here for a sec. Give me one sec here. Okay, let me play this for you guys. So here is Matt Applebaum speaking. You guys have to see this. This is ridiculous. When I saw this, I laughed my face off. You have an opportunity to work in the NFL, if you're blessed with that opportunity to work in the NFL, is that you have to be a teacher. You know what I mean? And I think that's something that's unique to coaching at that level. Not that there's not people at other levels that coach in that way. But I think it is expected and demanded at that level because the players are grown men. The players are professionals of what they do. For a younger coach, by, like my first runner and, and the Redskins, I'm younger than some of the players. So I'm not going to be able to go and yell at them, you know what I mean, and think that's coaching. I have to bring something to the table or they're not going to respect me. So I think working in the NFL brings that out of you. It demands that you are a master of your craft, that you bring something to the table of value and that you know how to articulate yourself and teach. So, and I think that that carries over across all levels. You know, you hear him say that, right? It carries over on all levels and you hear him, you know, the preaching, the teaching and, um, and, you know, and all that such. Well, you know, and Bobby Shell's had this up for the sake of comparison. Okay. Just for the sake of comparison. Listen to Lemuel Jean Pierre. You know, you're going to hear the question loud and clear. Listen to his answer. Where have you seen the most improvement from this unit so far this season? And I remember this too. Improvement. Yeah. Um, where have you seen the most improvement <laughs> from this unit One more so far time. this season? Improvement, yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like, you just see, that you, you you know, you listen to him, and Applebaum's much more articulated. He comes off as a teacher. This guy, you know, Lemuel Jean-Pierre just came off as, like, a meathead. Like, you know, when I heard him talk about Tristan Wirfs, you know what I mean? When you see that, 
you know, like if you would have asked that same question to Brian Flores about Javon Holland, for example, and this is, you know, because Brian Flores secondary is a specialty or even Gerald Alexander, you know, just because they're good defensive coaches, right? Brian Flores is a good defensive coach. Gerald Alexander is a good defensive coach. They would have given you an in-depth answer about what they were doing better and what they need to work on. Lemuel Jean-Pierre out here like a deer in headlights. And this was the guy Flores was trying to sell to us, was coming into his office every day and saying, oh, you know, trying to trick him and stuff like that. Yeah, okay. Okay, bro. That guy tricked. That guy can't even trick or treat on a Halloween, let alone trick a football mine. So, um, all right. To just take a comparison, just put things in perspective. The minds we're dealing with now compared to what we dealt with then on the offensive side of the ball. So I have to screenshot this thanks to Mike Gusecki's random blocking spree on Twitter weeks ago. Um, Durham Smythe set two career highs this season. You know, 34 receptions, 357 receiving yards with the Dolphins sweet out. Mike Gusecki tells the Dolphins, pay him. And, you know, obviously he's going to get paid. He had a career year. He's coming off a four-year deal where he only made like just over $4 million. I think, you know, he's only making like one or two million this past season. Clearly he's going to be an uptick. You know, I could see him being retained for about four to, you know, four to five is a sweet spot a year for me. Um, I don't, you know, once we get a higher than six, I start to cringe a little here. Well, a lot. And so, you know, Gusecki, better be careful what you're asking for, my friend. You know, I, I'm hearing rumblings. I'm reported on Patreon. I haven't reported anywhere, but I am hearing rumblings regarding Gusecki and his contract situation. Um, I'm just waiting to hear it from some other, you know, I'm ready to try to cross reference it. I've only heard it from one person so far, so I'm not ready to dive into that stuff quite yet. But, um, you know, when you look at this tight end room, you know, Mike Gusecki, you know, if you look at Adam Shaheen, if you look at Durham Smythe, if you look at Hunter Long, what more do they really need? What if Seathan Carter wants to play fullback? You know, if the kid out of um, Alabama, who was the tight end, uh, North Carolina, I always forget his name. I said him last stream too. You know, what, is that the idea? You know, so, see, then Carter might stick around if you play fullback. It's going to be interesting because they're bringing in a lot of tight end minds too. So, are they trying to see how capable Gusecki is as a blocker? Are they trying to improve Gusecki as a blocker? Mm. I've said it's, you know, he just screams big time weapon. And I don't know if Mike McDaniel will let that walk out the door. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. You know what I mean? Because I know Gusecki views himself as a receiver, and if he wants to get paid like one, that's where things get murky for me because it's going to be more expensive to pay him as a receiver than pay him as a tight end, especially if you have to franchise tag him, and especially if he gets deemed a wide receiver by the NFL because they're the ones who make the judgment call on the position. So, you know, Gusecki advocates for Durham Smythe to pay him. I think they will because Durham Smythe fits the, uh, what, what the outside zone scheme that, you know, McDaniel wants to implement here. Smythe is perfect. Shane's perfect. You know, so is uh, Hunter Long. It's Gusecki that has to improve to be a better fit. So ironic that he's talking about it when he needs to be worried about whether they're going to pay him or not. But I do agree with him, and you'll see it when I do my five players McDaniels should keep and five players Mike McDaniels should let walk. Durham Smythe is on the players they should keep. So um, finally here, uh, there was a couple interesting articles I wanted to go over um, with you guys just to keep you guys updated because I know some of them are behind paywalls and such. Um, so this first one here, um, is from Barry Jackson and it says Dolphins McDaniel on Waddle self-analysis to a, to a Boyer and more from his media rounds. 
So it said 10 notable comments from new Dolphins coach Mike McDaniel as he made the media rounds for one-on-one -on -one interviews in recent days. On Tua Tagovailoa to WQAM's Joe Rose, Dan Levitard, and Dolphin.com's Travis Wingfield, players have scars and need people to believe in them. That's the only business I'm in. I knew through the draft process he's a guy of integrity. There's a lot of pressure when you're a high draft pick. I wanted to let him know I'm excited to work with him. From what I heard, his work ethic is outstanding. So already they're trying to kill the uh, narrative that was out there, right? I could tell he's really going to attack it. He's a player with a chip on his shoulder. We need to teach him our system. He needs to work on fundamentals. Like I said, his footwork needs to improve. Um, you know, he needs, you know, overall his mechanics need to improve at times, right? Um, from what I heard, his work ethic, sorry, we need to teach him our system. He needs to work on fundamentals and you need to have our offense around him. McDaniel reminded that the first year I was with Jake Plummer and the Broncos, we went to the AFC championship game and Tua is a lot better than Jake Plummer. McDaniel told ESPN's Marcel Louis Jacques, what I've seen is a skill set that's very successful in this offense. You're seeing a very accurate passer that receivers love to catch footballs from. Tight spirals and accurate throws, which are huge for run after the catch. I also see great athleticism and some natural pocket movement. A tough competitor that's willing to stand in there when necessary. To Libertard on a player besides Tongue of Aloha that he believes he can extract something special from, Waddle Waddle, he said, of receiver Jalen Waddle. He actually yelled it. I talked with him the day after being hired, and he understands his leadership role on this team. The easiest way to get yards is to give it to a really talented player. I would start him in fantasy leagues. To Lebertard on the unique skills and that he believes he brings to a team, one of the greatest things I've been afforded is adaptability. Every player traditionally has their career year with us. I'm very adept at getting the best the players the ball in unique ways and adjusting to their skill set. To Levitard on what he can extract from an offensive line that allowed the most pressures in the league. Like I like he said, I've watched the tape. I see some pieces to work with. It's a point of emphasis. I'm making sure we have guys that can teach what we need to teach. And he's and he's doing that. We add players that are of value and we can emphasize. Like, see, he's backing up everything he said. That's what's crazy. Historically, our system does help people. I'm running a system that I've run with six different teams for 15 years and that's unprecedented why because Kyle Shanahan kept getting jobs at different places Boston coaches out Matt Applebaum who's expected to be hired as the Dolphins new offensive line coach pre ESPN got it in BC running game that finished 11th among 130 FBS teams in run blocking per PFF the Dolphins ranked 30th on of 32 teams in PFF's run blocking grades McDaniel to Wingfield about why running the ball will now be prioritized a good run game empowers the quarterback. There are a lot of pretty there. There are a lot of people pretty excited about throwing the ball. That gives you an advantage to people who try to run the ball. When you run the ball, you're taking time off the clock because you have to have the ball to score unless you turn it over. There will always be a competitive advantage if you run the ball well. The Dolphins were 31st in yards per carry average at three and a half last season. The 49ers were tied for 15th at 4.3, and the Dolphins were actually one of the worst teams in the NFL at yards after contact as well to Levitard on one of his most emotional moments from his first week on the job. He was speaking to employees from several departments and realizing the franchise hasn't won a playoff game in 20 years or whatever, but they're so invested in the team. When I started talking about what it would feel like to win a playoff game, that was a pretty emotional moment knowing how important the dolphins must feel to them. How, how moving it would bring would how moving it would be to bring the franchise hope. He told Levitard that I'm fully in analytics. I might not rely on what analytics says to do. You do take that shit in, but I'm not going to sit there and say 73% of the time works historically, so I'll do it. On why he's ready for the job, he mentioned that 49ers coach Shanahan really relied on me, allowed me to be his right-hand man, and opened my eyes to all the things he, the head coach does. I know I'm prepared for the moment, he involved me in a lot of his decisions, so I have a picture of how you're supposed to go through it. He told ESPN's Marcel Louis Jacques that he spent a good amount of time with defensive coordinator Josh Boyer before retaining him. Asked what contributed to that decision, he said, you learn when something is not broke and there are also relationships with people that come into it. And I relied on people who hired me to have been in the building with them. It's a calculated decision that's very informed. The proof is in the pudding. The top 10 defense last year, and I would not want to play against them. Can't beat them, join them. McDaniel to ESPN on hiring 49ers assistant John Embry 
and Wes Welker to coach the Dolphins' tight ends and receivers, respectively, with Embry. Almost every player he's ever had has had their career year under him. And with Welker, I'm really excited about where he is in his career. When he first came to San Francisco, it was his first position job. There was a huge part of your whole process when you're developing as a coach of going to a place as a first-time position coach, learning how to own that. I thought Wes was ready to take another step. So we just got a guy who's out here hiring people, who believes in people, and I love it, man. You know what I mean? I uh, I love it. So, you know, I I truly think, you know, he is putting together something special with this staff and building this culture in Miami. I really do, man. I really do. All right. So, and this is what Marcel Louis Jacques, what his uh, article came out today, and it really centered around Tua. It said, um, it's called, Dolphins Mike McDaniel promises to get all of that greatness out of Tua Tungvaloa. Flying 30,000 feet above the continental United States on February 7th, Mike McDaniel had his first conversation with the Miami Dolphins quarterback, Tua Tungvaloa, face-to-face in the most modern way possible on FaceTime. McDaniel was on route to South Florida for the second time in a five-day span, this time as the Dolphins' new head coach, using a cell phone that he says is still <laughs> inundated with congratulatory messages he spent time with during the roughly five-hour flight to meet the man who would be running his offense. One thing I know about you is you have the ambition to be great. My job is to coach you to get all that greatness out of you, McDaniel told Tonga Valoa. I'm going to make sure that when you look back at this day, you're going to be like, damn, that was one of the best days of my career. Whatever your opinion is regarding Tungvaloa, you can find evidence to support it in his 2021 season. Optimists see the NFL's seventh most efficient passer, 67.8 completion percentage, who commanded the offense more confidently than he did as a rookie, but played behind the league's worst pass blocking offensive line with no run game to support him. Skeptics see an injury-prone quarterback who missed the better part of five games in the first half of a sixth because of injuries, whose efficient passing numbers stem from conservative play calling and decision making. 6.29 air yards per attempt, 28th in the NFL. His second NFL season was marred by injuries and trade rumors, but the Dolphins are committed to Tango in 2022. McDaniel specifically said the quarterback skills are well suited to the offense. He will be asked to run, which I've been telling y'all, remember. You know, when everyone wanted in Peyton's offense, I was like, yo, he'd blossom there. But the other name I kept throwing out is that I would always say, imagine two in a Shanahan offense. Now I get to see it. Um, what I've seen is a skill set that I'm familiar with that's very successful in this offense, McDaniel told ESPN. You're seeing a very accurate passer that receivers love to catch footballs from. Tight spirals and accurate throws, which are huge, to run after the catch and yak yardage. What that means for an offense is you have people who can run after the catch. That's an outstanding skill set for them. I also see some great athleticism, some natural pocket movement, and really a tough competitor that's willing to stand in there when necessary. All of these things are components to a quarterback's game that are very important in NFL systems. The assessment of Tongue of Alo is nothing new. The teammates have long raved about his accuracy. He's going to throw a very catchable ball, and he's going to make the job easy for his receivers, tight end Mike Kosecki said during the season. I love playing with him. A lot of guys are making plays because of where he's putting the ball. Kosecki, an unrestricted free agent this offseason, would presumably be a beneficiary of Tungvaloa's skill set if he resigns with Miami. But the primary player to watch as McDaniel installs his offense is Jalen Waddell, who set the NFL rookie record for receptions by a rookie with 104 in 2021. Waddle was known as a big play threat at Alabama, and McDaniel has not so subtly hinted that he has plans for the 2021 first rounder pick, first round pick in 2022. It's still unclear, however, what exactly McDaniel's offense will look like. He might not know yet himself. We know McDaniel will call plays and plans to collaborate with a staff that includes new offensive coordinator Frank Smith, wide receiver coach Wes Welker, and Eric Studsville, who will remain as a on the staff as running back coach and associate head coach, per league source. Studsville was a running backs coach and co-offensive coordinator last year. Based on McDaniel's history as a play designer, offensive coordinator, and run game coordinator with the 49ers, it seems safe to assume Miami will place an emphasis on the rushing attack. But there is a danger in assuming because one thing McDaniel has told us about the Dolphins' offense is that it will be tailored to fit the players they have, not the other way around. It's a philosophy he became 
intimate with during his years in Washington with future NFL head coaches Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, and Matt LaFleur. When the team drafted quarterback Robert Griffin III in 2012, the staff installed scheme-heavy in-zone read concepts, something none of them had any experience coaching prior to that season. McDaniel said learning that lesson during his formative years as a coach taught him the value of being able to adapt by any means necessary. Why you got to get me excited, Mike? Finally, a guy who gets it. Oh, everything is tailored to the skill set of our players, and it looks a little different, McDaniel said, referencing the offense McVay, Shanahan, and LaFure now run. It's the coolest part of our job, but it's also very normal because we went through that in a drastic way in our formative years. It's really fun because you don't limit yourself, and you kind of don't know where it's going to go, but you're working with players, finding out what they're comfortable with, and adjusting on the fly. It's one of my favorite parts of the process. So... This man is telling you he's going to tailor the offense to all of our players, you know, and, you know, we've got so many resources that, you know, he's going to get guys that fits his vision and fits what he wants to do. So I wouldn't fully buy into all of that, but the thing is some of our players already tailored to it, right? Like, you know, here's the thing, guys, guess what? Tua Tungvaloa is tailored for the West coast offense. He has been since he came out. Austin Jackson's skill set, tailored for this. Robert Hunt, tailored for this. Dieter as a guard, I think he's tailored for this. You know, Waddle is going to be tailored for this. I think Matt Collins is tailored for it. Durham Smythe is tailored for it. Uh, Shaheen, Hunter Long, tailored for it. You know, I even see Salvin Ahmed or Miles Gaskin making it through because remember, Salvin Ahmed came from the 49ers. They didn't want to lose him, and Miles Gaskin and Salvin Ahmed are very comparable. So it's going to be interesting to see how this offense starts to come together. Um, I can't wait, man. I really honestly can't wait, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, 2022, I think we're going to be better than people give us. You know, I, I really would not be surprised if we are fighting for a playoff spot. Philippe, I think they might develop him as a left tackle. I don't think he has the anchor for a guard. We'll see. So I, I really think there's some stuff here to get excited about, people. I really do, man. I believe in this team. And, you know, I think Lynn Bowden is another guy who fits perfectly in this. You know, we've already got some players on the roster offensively that fit perfectly and are going to be in for the transition. So I'm excited, man. I think our offense is going to really turn around. Ronnie, what about Liam? I don't think Liam is athletic enough. I don't think he has feet. He has the fleet of foot enough. I don't think his feet are fleet of foot. Like, sorry. I don't think he's athletic enough. I don't think he's fleet of foot enough. And his arm is an arm length is obviously an issue. I've been saying since we drafted him. I don't know. And he doesn't have the anchor to go inside. I don't think they're going to trust the right side with Liam Eikenberg in this offense. And he's not a Mike McDaniel guy. See, now we're flipping over. This is the thing we're flip when you flip over a coaching staff. Like I said, when we flipped over to Flores, right? I would say, okay, this guy's going, that guy's going because, you know, they are not Flores guys. Well, now we're that's where we're going. Now that's where we're going. So here's the deal, guys. I'm going to be back on Thursday, and we're going to go over the top five players Mike McDaniel should keep and the top five players he should let walk. And then on Friday, we are going to get into – it's going to be a birthday stream because it's my birthday on Friday. I'll be live on Friday. we got some things to cover, including the top five biggest needs – or the, sorry, no. Not top five, I correct myself. The top needs for the Miami Dolphins heading into free agency. So that will be my Thursday and Friday show. You know, um, if y'all want to come back and chop it up a bit, I'll drop a link. Um, but, you know, that's uh, what we're looking at. So I'll be back. If news breaks tomorrow, you know I'll be back. But um, so on Thursday, I will do the top five players Mike McDaniel should retain. And the top five he should let walk, as well as other news and notes. 
And then on Friday, it'll be a birthday stream. I hope all y'all can come out. Um, I'll be bringing y'all up here after I get through the news and uh, do my little thing. And I'm going to do um, the top needs for the Miami Dolphins heading into 2022 free agency. All right. So Roddy's like, it's Friday is also payday for most of us. See you. I see your reason. Hey, just happens to correlate, baby. So uh, it was the same day last year, Ronnie. Go check the receipts. The video is out there. Um, so I'll drop a video, uh, link for you guys if you want to come here and chop it up for a little bit. But, guys, I will see all y'all um, on Thursday. Until then, I appreciate each and any, every one of you. If anything breaks, I'll be back tomorrow. Guys, I love all y'all. Fins up all day, every day. And, uh, you know, have a good hump day tomorrow if I don't see y'all. I'm out. Peace.